Hey folks, David Stewart here. I haven't done one of these fallacy videos in a good long time, so I thought it was a good time to stop and talk about a fallacy that I've been seeing a lot lately, which is what I call the Vegas stakes fallacy. This is quite different from the gambler's fallacy, as you shall see, but like the gambler's fallacy, it tends to be a fallacy of reasoning, not a fallacy of argumentation, meaning the way that one thinks about something is incorrect rather than the way one expresses an argument. The essence of the Vegas stakes fallacy is this. There's an assumption that there is some fixed probability of something happening when that is not the case, or there's not enough evidence to create a fixed probability. This happens mostly through the use of statistics either the misuse of statistics, the deceptive use of statistics quite often, or just not understanding them. And I see three different big variants that seem to happen over and over again. The first one is the misuse of averages or median, which are different things, and I'll explain that. Uh, the second one is the use of what I call normative statistics. And the third one is an assumption of stochasticity when there is none. Stochasticity means randomness. Let's talk about the first one, which is the misuse of average. Average, if you're just talking to a person, very often gets confused with something like typical or normative. So when somebody says an average person, the truth is there is no average person. An average in statistics or math is when you add up the total sum of all all the data and then divide it by the number of pieces of data and then you get the average. Um, so an average when you're looking at a data set may not include a bunch of information that's really, really relevant. And that is usually distribution data. And this also goes for median. So you may hear like the average life expectancy is this. And a lot of people hear that and they think that's how long I'm going to live or they hear it about the past. The average life expectancy for people in the Middle Ages was 33, and they're like, oh man, most people died at 33. But that's not the case. That's just all the data divided by all the different numbers there. So average life expectancy is all the deaths divided by all the different years, and then you get an average life expectancy. What's missing from that is where those deaths are concentrated. So for an example, if we use the... Um, use the Middle Ages life expectancy. Um, this happens a lot with writers where they're, they're trying to write something in the medieval period and everybody's dead by the time they're 30 or 40, uh, or they're an old man at 40. Nobody thought 40 year olds were old men in the Middle Ages. If you look at the concentrations of death, mostly it was children, right? Um, or people who were very old. So uh, if you made it to adulthood, usually you had a good chance of living a good long life into 50 or 60 until some random disease just happened to kill you. So the missing distribution, which is not like a Gaussian uh, bell curve, um, is really more like a U where people that are young and people that are old tend to be dying more um, than people in the middle. So people in their middle age tend to be fairly healthy for a long time until um, some disease happens to knock them out. Um, this is the same thing if you were to transport that into modern times. If the life expectancy is 77, that doesn't mean you are that's the most likely age for you to live at all. Um, that just means that's the average year and what you do in your life may raise, lower that. Random chance may take you out. There's no fixed probability, in other words, that you're going to get to 77. This is true of lots of things that you may hear. The average person has you know, so many car accidents in their lifetime. And you think, well, I'm going to end up with three car accidents. If it's three or four, you know, that's not, there's no fixed likelihood that you're going to end up with any number of car accidents, or you may end up with a lot more. Um, but the likelihood of those happening is not determined by the total average. It's determined by a bunch of other different things uh, that have nothing to do with the average, like where you drive, how often you drive, what hours you drive, um, all those sorts of things. Um, likewise, the word median, which means something different than average. If you remember your math classes, there was mean, median, and mode. And you were probably wondering why you had to remember these. Mean is the average. Mode is the most common number, and median is just the number in the middle. So if you're missing the mode, which gives you a clue as to some of the distribution, just a tiny piece of it, the most frequently occurring the num uh, number. Median is just the number in the middle. So you may hear a statistics like the, um, I think the average U.S. household income, not average, I'm sorry, median U.S. household income is $56,000. It's around $56,000. I think I was reading it in Forbes magazine. Um, 
Now you may hear that and you may think that's really good. Um, but what's missing from that is where the distribution is on either side. So um, half of the people are above 56,000, half the people are below 56,000. But how many of those people, where are the people who are below 56,000? If you're to look, you may see there's quite a few people who make zero or just receive money like from the government. And then there's probably a bigger concentration of people that are making somewhere in the middle of that, like $30,000 a year. And then fewer people reach that 56,000. So 56,000 might be a really, really low number. You might have like a U distribution like life expectancy. In this case, you might have just like a gradual slope down and 56,000 happens to be the number in the middle. And it may get even weirder if you were to do average because Yes, you're including people that make no money or receive benefits uh, because they make so little money. And you're also including people that make $100 million a year. So the average might be completely deceptive as to where the money's actually going. So averages minus distribution can be very deceptive. Uh, and I think a lot of media outlets tend to use these. I'm not accusing Forbes of this for actually reporting this. They report median income because that's the way a lot of these things are tracked. Um, but lots of media outlets will talk about this in a way to either paint a darker picture or a rosier picture in the mind of people interpreting it because they hear that average and they think that that's the most likely thing um, that people are going to end up with is they're going to end up with $56,000. Uh, and then that's really, really not the case. If you've ever heard the old adage, never cross a river that is on average four feet deep, that's really where that comes from. Because if you hear that it's on average four feet deep and you think the normative value is four feet, meaning it's going to be four feet pretty much all the way across the river, you're going to end up in a spot of trouble when you realize that you are adding up the data points from the zero, the shore, all the way down to 16 feet or 20 feet in the middle of the river in which you, uh, you and your horse drown. Um, so that's really where the deceptive averages come from. Now, I consider this a little bit different from the second big avenue that people um, can make this Vegas stakes fallacy with, and that is with normative statistics. Normative statistics are a bit like an average, except it's divided up on some function of time, uh, usually time. So you may hear something like, Every 15 minutes, somebody dies due to a drunk driver. That's what I would call a normalized statistic. The problem is that's definitely untrue. Uh, it's not every 15 minutes that somebody is randomly dying um, of, a, of a drunk driving crash. Those crashes or those uh, fatalities are occurring concentrated in particular ways. Again, the distribution. They're, you know, They're happening at certain times of the day or night in certain places, and then other times of the day, they're, the likelihood of them happening is really, really low. Again, it's not a fixed odd. So when you hear something like that, and of course, um, when I was a high school teacher, we had this every 15 minutes thing for a week where they, every 15 minutes, they'd have like a heartbeat pump through here, and I'd have to explain this to kids, but like, listen, there's not, nobody's dying every 15 minutes. This is happening concentrated in particular times of the day um, and particular places that aren't here. So you're not going to randomly get hit by a drunk driver walking home from school. Um, or I should say it's extremely low likelihood. Uh, but you hear normalized statistics and you make makes you think that things happen at regular intervals when they in fact do not. Um, another great example is when you hear a normative statistic like one in three black American males will spend time in jail or prison during their lifetime. You hear a normalized statistic like that, and it's really shocking. Now, I actually don't know if this one is true, um, because I'm not sure how it was arrived there. Uh, I've seen a couple of different organizations talk about this, but we'll just pretend it's true for the purpose of this video. One in three African American males is going to end up in prison during their lifetime. Does that mean when you meet a black man, he has a 33% chance of having been in jail or prison. And the answer is, you don't know that. You can't say that there's any kind of fixed odds. And again, that might be because of the way that they arrived at the statistic minus distribution, meaning um, that may be the total number of you know people that are incarcerated uh, compared to the total number of black males and it ends up being 30%. But it may be that it's less than 30% and you have the same people being jailed over and over again, which is true because you do have Pareto distributions when it comes to crime. So uh, a, a big majority of the crimes are committed by a small, tiny minority of any subset of people, regardless of the color of their skin. Um, 
But also there's no such thing as an average person. So if you meet, quote, a random black person, there is no random black person. You're meeting them in a particular place that's going to alter those odds very, very significantly. Uh, and this is an argument I've gotten into with a number of people where they want to use these sorts of statistics on like race and crime to prejudge people based on the color of their skin without realizing that they, you don't get a random person. There's no such thing as a randomly sampled uh, human being that you can apply these odds to and come up with some sort of probability, partly because of distribution, partly because of the way that you meet people. If you meet a black man walking down the street and he's holding a briefcase and he's wearing a suit, um, what makes you think that he's has a 33% chance of having been to prison at some point or that he has some future probability of being in prison? Um, an easy way to explain um, or, or to show how this uh, this line of thinking is erroneous is imagine that you're black, right? Or say to a black person, uh, um, say a young, find a young black um, young black man or young black boy, and say, "Well, you know, one in three black males do do time in prison at some point in their life. That means you have a thirty three percent chance of going to prison." If you were the black person, you'd be like, I don't have any chance of going to prison because I'm not going to rob anyone or I'm not going to sell. I'm not going to commit crimes that are going to send me to jail. I'm in control of my actions. So why would there be any likelihood of it happening to me? And this brings me to the third thing, which is assuming there's stochasticity when there's not. Assuming that there's a randomized sample when there isn't. Um, so in this case, if you were to tell a black person, they have a 33% chance of going to jail because they happen to be black. Um, they would be like, well, I, that's not true because I'm in control of my actions. I can choose not to commit a crime. Now, there's a very, very far outside chance that I could be falsely imprisoned, um, but that's probably not the vast, vast, vast majority of any race of people that happen to end up in prison, the vast, vast majority are there because they've committed some crime and been uh, prosecuted by the government or by other people and have ended up in that prison cell. So if you're in control of your actions, that means that you are not going to be subject to some uh, statistic influencing the likelihood of, of, um, of you ending up in something like prison. So there isn't stochasticity involved when you are acting. Now, if as soon as you transfer yourself outside of that situation, why would you assume that the randomness is influencing that person's decision as well? If you happen to personally have a friend who's black would you think that he has a 30% chance of ending up in jail, given everything that you know about him? I would hope not. And um, if you actually think that, then why are you hanging out with, with somebody who's who's basically a criminal, right? Or somebody who you really think has a high likelihood of, of being a criminal. Um, I think if you were to express that to, to somebody who, who happens to be African-American, they would find it quite... Uh, quite offensive and for good reason. And that's because they're in control of their own actions and they're their own people. Now, that doesn't mean that hearing these normative statistics or these normalized statistics is completely useless. It can, it can shed, some, shed some light on something that's happening. You could put it into perspective. You know, every 15 minutes, somebody dies in a car crash. It just means that, you know, it's a, it's a frequent event. There's a lot of people who die due to drunk drivers there's a lot of black males who end up in prison. That doesn't mean that uh, those statistics then create a likelihood of some future event happening. So those are the three big ones. <laughs> averages, the misuse of averages, normalized statistics, and then finally assuming that there's uh, some amount of randomness or chance involved when there's not chance involved, there's free will involved, there's a person's personal actions that can control that. And that's kind of true for things like car crashes, for like, you know, dying of lung cancer, right? If you if you avoid smoking, you know, your chance of getting lung cancer is a lot less than if you do smoke. Um, so it, if you were to look at the total number of of, of, uh, of smoking or of, of lung cancer deaths, that's not your, your chance of getting lung cancer. Chance of getting lung cancer is influenced by your actions uh, and doesn't have those sorts of fixed odds. So anyway, that's my, um, that's my little spiel on what I call the Vegas stakes fallacy. Um, it's really, really used deceptively often by the media to make people think that there's some fixed likelihood of something happening when there isn't based on a statistic that's just gathering large amounts of, of uh, data and, 
and sort of throwing out distribution or ignoring um, lots of things that may lead to particular areas um, of that data existing. So thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget that the right stream happens every Wednesday at 6 o'clock Pacific. That's 9 p.m. Eastern time. And I will see you on there to answer any of your writing discussions. So that's going to happen when you're watching this today at 6 p.m. Uh, and that's every Wednesday. And uh, if you want to support me, you can buy my books. You can find most of them linked at dvspress.com or just search my name on Amazon. Or you can find me at subscribestar.com slash David B. Stewart. I'm no longer on Patreon, so that's uh, what I'm doing instead. Uh, and if that's a way that you can give back a little value if I've imparted some value with this. So thanks for listening to this, um, this little explanation and um, let me know what you think about it and I'll see you guys next time.